Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today, as Ashwin talked about it, I'll talk about some of the uh, multiphysics simulations that are of relevance to process and semiconductor industry, especially at the scale that the industry would want this phenomenon to be studied. So before we begin the talk, uh, all the simulations and studies that you'll see today are, uh, are, have, as in, have been carried out by members of Sankhya Sutra Labs. Uh, and uh, the list of them can be seen here. And uh, uh, all of these were, uh, as in the technical assistance for all of these simulations have been provided by Professor Anshomali and Professor Kumar. So, uh, the outline of talk is as follows. I'll briefly talk about uh, Sankhya Sutra Labs, uh, and then the uh, multiphysics simulations that uh, uh, we have carried out at Sankhya Sutra Labs. And uh, then afterwards, I've uh, I sort of divided this talk in two, three levels of simulations. These are uh, sort of defined at uh, on the figure on the right that uh, uh, at molecular scale, we generally study these uh, phenomena if we have to study them in computational uh, domain then we use uh, molecular techniques to study some of the things and uh, uh, then <clears throat> while molecular simulations are uh, useful and they do provide uh, a, a lot of information about how the individual molecules are behaving interacting with other molecules and things like that uh, typically the uh, as in the setups that we encounter in industry would be in the range wherein the characteristic lengths would be either in mm or meters. And uh, for continuous process, for example, you would want your reactors to run for, uh, let's say, 100 days or something like that. Or if it's batch process, it can go from anywhere between a minute or two couple of hours. Uh, so given that, that uh, the phenomenon of interest to industry are in the regime where we have uh, uh, large length scales and time scale and <clears throat> uh, this thing the computational methods then range from various length scales for for example molecular dynamics mesoscale modeling continuum modeling and engineering design the focus of today's talk will be on systems level modeling that is where the engineering design aspect comes in then a continuum and mesoscale modeling, wherein I will uh, talk about some of the simulations that uh, uh, we have carried out at Sankhya Sutra Labs to understand various phenomena for a given set of, for example, fluid flow in a cyclone separator, then uh, gasification, similarly heat exchanger, conjugate heat transfer phenomena, and things like that. As well as uh, there are still quite a lot of uh, uh, studies which require attention to details and understanding of the phenomenon at molecular level. Most of the deposition studies that are carried out in semiconductor processing uh, fall into these regimes. <clears throat> so I'll also show some of the examples from these uh, uh, studies as well. So, yeah. Sankhya Sutra Labs, as uh, most of you may know by now, or is mostly for the people who have probably joined for this webinar for the first time, uh, is uh, Sankhya Sutra Lab uh, was incubated in uh, this institute called JNC, uh, JNC ASR, that is Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research. It is primarily based on the work that uh, Professor Anshumali and uh, his colleague carried out <clears throat> during uh, his stay at JNC. And uh, so <clears throat> from there onwards, we worked on various simulation methods in 2019 reliance industries uh, acquired a significant uh, majority stake in sankhya sutra labs since then we have had various collaborations with industry as well as uh, <clears throat> with various uh, government labs and uh, we have been working on uh, uh, areas such as aerospace process industry semiconductor manufacturing healthcare uh, with uh, either uh, for people in India or outside. And uh, our, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, we uh, 
as in we aim at Sankhya Sutra is to be able to carry out multi-physics simulations at the scale that the industry requires. And I'll show some of the examples later, but uh, what we see is uh, most of the problems that we encounter in industry are multi-physics problems in some sense. So while fluid dynamics is uh, the heart of most of the setups that we see, However, uh, these the fluid dynamics is governed or is also coupled with various phenomena such as uh, thermal transport, uh, phase change, uh, interaction between fluid and particles, then uh, radiation may also affect the temperature field. Then in a multi-component system, you may have reactions. Uh, as similarly, this again very important for semiconductor industry is uh, rarefied flows and uh, then again, for in aerospace industry, aeroacoustics is also something of uh, interest to the community. So the phenomena that uh, we will talk about today mostly deal with mixing, heat transfer, particle dynamics, uh, rarefied flow reactions, and uh, uh, yeah, that's about it. So. Uh, this, in summary, these are the, some of the simulations that I'll talk about. So they range from, uh, for example, you know, mixing in a bioreactor to understanding the <clears throat> pressure drop and flow behavior in an electrolyzer simulation. Similarly, there are multi-phase flow simulations and then uh, conjugate heat transfer and gasification and uh, these kinds of applications. So, and uh, for most of these simulations, uh, we have used uh, the compute required for these simulations, especially for the problems that uh, uh, mimic the industrial setup uh, with all its details. Uh, the compute requirement can be large. And for that, we use our own in-house uh, compute cluster called Rudra. It's one of the, as in, in private space, it is probably the largest cluster that is available in India. And uh, overall in India, it's six largest cluster, uh, which has about pet one petaflop uh, of, uh, which carries out one petaflop operations per second. And uh, uh, the overall bandwidth uh, for the entire cluster is about uh, 100 terabytes per second. So as we discussed at the start, uh, I'll talk about some of the simulations that uh, uh, we have carried out at Sankhya Sutra. Uh, so here the focus will be mostly on the applications, the requirements for the computational study and what kind of results we get from these studies. Uh, the details of numerical methods are not part of this uh, presentation, but if you have any questions, you can ask us, we can discuss it either after the, after the presentation or even after that also. So that's also not an issue. Uh, so, We'll first start with systems level modeling, and then we'll go to we'll go to lower scales and look at the applications that are of interest at different regimes. So, at systems level modeling, we'll talk about uh, uh, how it is important for battery design as well as for electrolyzer design. So, in most cases, the systems level modeling would be required when you are in initial design phases. Because while you know your macroscopic parameters, for example, you want certain performance from your battery and things like that, you do not know all the details or you do not know how <clears throat> your battery should be designed. So from that point of view, you use computational models to uh, sort of, uh, as in you can do it in two ways. You can carry out experiments with various models and see which one is the uh, most suited model for the uh, required purposes, or you can carry out computational studies, uh, first optimize the or minimize the parameter space. And from that, once you select few designs, uh, carry out experiments for those designs, and then again, uh, decide which one would be better. So in this case, the systems level modeling has been used to, for example, uh, it can be used uh, to uh, uh, decide what what would be the design of a particular equipment, be it battery, electrolyzer, or uh, things like that. So for batteries, uh, <clears throat> the one of the reason it is used is to validate the battery chemistry. 
so what that means is while you are still not sure how your how your cell stack will look like but you want certain performance from your cell and for that you optimize your battery chemistry uh, and the that the way that is done is uh, while the cell structure is quite complex in the sense uh, there are multiple layers of uh, this anode cathode and then which are separated by separator and for a cylindrical cell they are all rolled together in a cell uh, what you do is or you assume that instead of solving for this complex uh, uh, setup wherein <clears throat> your cathode and anode are also active particles in a, a matrix instead of a, a one single homogeneous material so this uh, particle size can range from nanometers to up to few micrometers whereas your cell size uh, depending on the application can be in mm's or in uh, let's say hundreds of mm's so <clears throat> then go you won't be able to have a uh, single model that will go from nanoscale to a, a scale which is about mm so then you divide this problem into various scales at nanoscale you look at the uh, properties of individual electrode particle and then from those properties you uh, decide <coughs> how the how would you model the electrode as a homogeneous material at a continuum scale and at systems level modeling you sort of uh, ignore all the variations in the electrode and you just in this case which where we have used the model called single particle model we replace the entire electrode with one particle we say that the variation of concentration and uh, voltages and other things inside the particle represent the same variation that we are likely to see in the uh, cell uh, similarly the <coughs> cathode is also replaced with a single particle and then we solve for uh, uh, concentration and voltage inside each of these electrodes that is anode and cathode and then inside the electrode uh, uh, where we also have a separator and uh, so here then finally what we plot is so for given cell capacity what will be the maximum cell voltage for different current rates that current rate here means that uh, so current rate of one means that a given cell with whatever its capacity is will get discharged completely in one hour uh, so <clears throat> then current rate of 0.5 would mean that it takes the same cell to complete it takes 2 hours to, uh, for that same cell to get completely discharged current uh, rate of uh, 10 would mean that it takes only 6 minutes for that cell to discharge and point what would mean that it takes about 10 hours so then here what we are plotting is uh, the cell voltage as function of different cell capacities this allows us to so here i get the assumption is the current density remains constant and this allows us to identify the cell performance even before we actually build the cell and these are is in with it is with these kinds of models that we can identify which are the factors that are limiting the performance and how can we change the chemistry to improve the uh, or to to improve the cell performance here various lines indicate the results from uh, experiments as well as models so the crosses here are the results from experiments uh, the circles here are from are results from <clears throat> work of garapati et al that was published in ecs in a couple of months back and uh, the uh, black line here in all the plot indicates the results that uh, we have obtained with a similar model at ssl Uh, the similar uh, with similar objectives that is uh, while uh, you, you do want uh, while you uh, as in uh, while you do want to uh, work with an electrolyzer but in initial phases uh, when you are designing an electrolyzer you want to know what should be the size of electrolyzer what should be how many number of channels that uh, you should be putting inside electrolyzer what should be the length of those channels and things like that and uh, for that uh, while you can still do cfd simulations but for multiple designs doing 
so many cft simulations can be expensive so then we have carried out uh, modeling studies to calculate for example gas liquid uh, uh, ratio inside the channel as function of the length of the channel then as function of uh, the gas liquid stoichiometry at the inlet and uh, things like that what this helps is uh, what this helps uh, as in the reason why these studies are carried out is with these kinds of simple model which can be run quickly the designers can optimize their initial design quite quickly and then after that once a preliminary design has been uh, or like a set of preliminary designs have been decided upon uh, detailed cft simulations can be carried out to uh, see the or understand the performance of those designs in more details uh, now i'll talk about uh, cft or uh, like uh, continuum uh, simulations where uh, we will look at various applications that are of relevance to industry uh, here uh, as in, we will first start with uh, scalability, which that is important because, as I mentioned at the start, uh, we want to look at applications where we are able to uh, simulate the entire system without having to make any uh, assumptions or about the size or uh, without having to look at each component in isolation or things like that. Um, and uh, so for that, one of the, so here for uh, fluid flow simulations, we use a method called lattice Boltzmann method. Uh, in this talk, I've not included the details of lattice Boltzmann method, but uh, as I mentioned, we can discuss that later if that's a, uh, if there is any question about it. So here, what we are simulating is a sort of canonical and uh, uh, a setup in the, <clears throat> that we see uh, quite often in CFT uh, problems is we have a cube where the top wall of that cube is moving with a constant velocity. Uh, and uh, because of that, the fluid inside the uh, cavity, uh, it, uh, as in it, the, it, uh, it reaches a certain velocity field. What we are showing here is uh, comparison of the velocity fields that we get with the simulations at SSL versus the results that we have from literature. Uh, so one of the things you'll notice is the simulations at SSL were 3D. And the simulations that we're comparing against are 2D. Uh, but at Reynolds number 10, this is OK. We have carried out simulations at higher Reynolds number also, where the results have been compared with uh, equivalent 3D simulations. Those also we can discuss later if that's a requirement. Uh, on right hand side, what I'm showing is the uh, time taken or the scalability of the uh, fluid flows uh, solver uh, for a case where uh, the similar kind of setup was simulated uh, uh, for different number of uh, processors. So when we keep the system size same and change the number of MPI processes to simulate a particular system, this is called a strong scaling. And uh, as you would intuitively expect, uh, if you have a simulation that is, uh, uh, as in, that is completely parallel, then if it takes, let's say one second with one MPI process, it should take 0.5 seconds with uh, two MPI processes. So then if you plot the time required for that simulation as function of uh, MPI processes, you will get a blue line, which is seen here, uh, that will have slope of minus one. <clears throat> the black line that you see here is the time that uh, the simulations for this lid driven cavity has taken. And uh, if we fit a linear curve or lead, uh, uh, slope line to it, we see that the slope is around 0.88. It's not complete, exactly equal to one. And the reasons for that are, although the lattice Boltzmann method is uh, scalable, but for uh, real life problems, we also have boundary conditions and other operations that are not really, uh, that do not really scale well with the compute. And because of that, we do have some performance drop. So I'll start with the, problem that is of interest to chemical engineers and that cyclone separation. 
what I'm showing here is a benchmark simulation from literature. This is from the AICHE publication mentioned here. And uh, the Reynolds number for this simulation is around 14,000. For a cyclone separator, this is on the lower side, but uh, these were the results that we have available from this publication. And uh, here the simulations have been carried out again with the lattice Boltzmann method. What we what you see here in the video is the flow profile that developed from start uh, in transient. And what you see in comparison plots here is the comparison of the results that are obtained in the reference versus what we get here. Um, so for, for example, the top view of the velocity profile. And so these are the contour plots or the velocity vector directions. And at the bottom, you see the uh, velocity along uh, as in at x t equal to uh, 2.9 d as well as at inlet. And those are compared with the <clears throat> results that we have from references. As you can see, these are uh, these match quite well. And uh, one of the important things here is the simulations have been carried out at y plus 10. That is very close. So for direct numerical simulations, which, where you actually resolve the Kolmogorov length scale for turbulent flow simulations as well, uh, the y plus would be equal to 1. Here, the y plus is around 10. And uh, although the compute used is on slightly higher side, that is 128 processors, but because the program scales well with the compute, it doesn't take a lot of time for these kinds of simulations to be carried out. Another example that I have is uh, from uh, bioreactors or reactors in general, uh, wherein we, uh, as in a typical reactor setup is, there is a vessel in which uh, there would be an impeller at the center. The shapes of the impeller depend on what is the desired velocity profile. Uh, here we have taken an impeller, which is called a Rustin impeller. The Reynolds number for this kind of uh, setup is around 10,000. And uh, what I'm showing here is a comparison of various quantities such that, such as uh, like tip velocity uh, in the radial direction, then a tangential velocity, uh, as well as the turbulent kinetic energy. Uh, while there are a lot of lines in this graph, what I'll ask you is to uh, look at the lines with color green and orange. So the green uh, lines with green color are the experimental results, and the lines with orange are the results that we have obtained at Sankhya Sutra Labs. Uh, what you see is uh, for radial velocity, uh, there is good match between experiments, uh, simulations carried out at Sankhya Sutra Labs as well as uh, simulations that uh, are uh, not for turbulent flow, they are not as accurate. That is RAN simulation, uh, or th those are called Reynolds average Neva Stokes uh, uh, simulations. So, uh, so, so far as the velocity quantities are concerned, we have a good match between all of those uh, simulation methods. But uh, as we go to uh, higher order quantities, such as turbulent kinetic energy, we see that RAN simulation, that's the red line here, that deviates quite a lot from the uh, uh, high fidelity simulations, such as either LES, that is large eddy simulations, or uh, the simulations that we have carried out at Sankarutra Labs, that is uh, uh, this uh, orange line over here. Uh, so uh, this, as well as I'll show some later plots also, with what this shows is the simulations that we have at Sankhya Sutra Labs. If the compute is available, they will match the accuracy of LES simulations without having to explicitly add any turbulence model for any given setup. Uh, so the same method has been extended to carry out free surface flows. I'm showing two of the examples here, wherein uh, instead of the React Instead of that reactor being filled entirely with the fluids that are of interest to us, so it's partially filled and the rest of it is air. And in these kinds of simulation, the shape of the interface that gets formed inside the vessel 
is of interest as well as what is the power requirement for rotation and other things. And uh, these simulations have been carried out with uh, uh, free, uh, with as in using same lattice Boltzmann method, but in addition, on top of that, we use free surface model to carry out uh, these kinds of simulations. The validation for a free surface model is shown here for a benchmark case from literature, wherein we have a small droplet which uh, falls down due to gravity and then impinges on a thin sheet of liquid. And uh, what is compared here typically is called uh, crown radius as function of time. So crown radius is the mean radius of this ring that gets formed as the drop, uh, as the liquid droplet falls onto the, um, so this is the crown radius, or this is the crown here that, uh, and the radius of this crown is what is plotted as function of time here. As you can see, these, uh, the crown radius that we get from the simulations at SSL also matches well with the reference that we have available. So for those who are interested, the Reynolds number for these simulations, uh, as in the Reynolds number here is of the order of 10,000, whereas the Reynolds number here uh, for the uh, validation case is around 2,000 and the Weber number was around 800. Uh, another thing that will be of interest to pe uh, people and in general in industry is flow through porous media. These again for chemical industry, these important for flow through back pits and uh, or uh, flow through <clears throat> uh, this fluidized bed where the solid fraction is much larger and it's not possible to consider them as point particles. Uh, so these kinds of flows can be simulated in two ways. Uh, one of the way is uh, we resolve each of these pores individually and these are uh, as in uh, these would be quite expensive simulations but the advantage with these is uh, uh, we get uh, uh, we get all the details uh, for pressure drop for each of the pores separately and uh, these allow us to these especially useful in for example reservoir modeling uh, Another way to do these kinds of simulations is uh, use a model for the porous media, the pressure drop due to porous media. This is typically done with what is called uh, argon equation, which argon equation is combination of uh, the uh, forces uh, or the pressure is, is essentially a combination of pressure drop due to viscous term as well as inertial term. Uh, so at low Reynolds number, if the flow through uh, porous media is at low Reynolds number, it's the viscous term uh, that will dominate as whereas in the regime where the Reynolds number is high, it's the inertial term that will uh, lead to the pressure drop due to uh, porous presence of porous media. Here again as a benchmark case, uh, we are carrying out similar lid driven cavity simulations but in presence of porous media. And the results here have been compared with uh, uh, literature. So in case when there is uh, almost uh, no solid present, that is the porosity is very close to one. So porosity of one would mean that it's all fluid, no solid. So in case cases where the porosity is close to one, we expect the results to be close to uh, simulations without porous media. And that's what we see here also. They and there is a small variation between the results with porous media and without porous media. Whereas in the case where we have large porosity, the results would be different from a no porosity case. Here we have compared the results with a benchmark case from literature. Uh, now I'll talk about a couple of conjugate heat transfer simulations. These are of interest. Uh, when it comes to heat exchangers that are there in various industries, as in various industries. Uh, what I'm showing here is an example of a diverter in, in a nuclear fusion reactor. Um, so there is a small section from the entire reactor that has been uh, chosen for this particular study. Uh, what you see here is uh, just outside the so on the top, when we when wherever this plasma written, that's the nuclear chamber. That's where the fusion reaction happens. 
and uh, as the reaction happens there is a lot of energy that is let out from that reactor this energy is uh, uh, this uh, absorbed and the reactor is kept uh, at maintained at the desired temperatures through combination of uh, uh, mechanisms first is the reactor wall itself is quite thick and the wall is meant uh, cooled using a uh, uh, flow of molten salt uh, which is uh, this uh, fluorium lithium beryllium uh, oxide uh, through these uh, channels and then we have a thick four centimeter in conal uh, wall and this entire assembly is uh, placed in a heat uh, liquid bath of iron uh, flyby and this which is around it uh, or 900 kelvin so in in present case we ignore the liquid bath we consider the uh, the cooling channels as well as the inconel and we say that the top uh, portion of this tungsten receives uh, uh, heat at around uh, 12 megawatts per meter square and with these the temperature profile and the flow profile in these kinds of simulations can be seen here so what you see here is uh, uh, here because the plasma is from top the temperature of the tungsten rises first and which the heat then is passed to both uh, the obstruction inside the cooling channel as well as to the fluid inside the cooling channel so uh, the fluid temperature is shown here and at the bottom we have the velocity field the presence of this baffle inside the cooling channel uh, helps create the turbulent flow which enhances the heat transfer and uh, in this figure you can see that the top portion of the uh, fluid uh, receives as in the temperature of that increases first compared to the bottom portion that's because the heat comes from uh, top in this particular case. Uh, similar studies have been carried out for a uh, heat exchanger from literature, uh, which is uh, particularly useful for power electronics application. Uh, so the way this setup is, uh, it's a small heat exchanger wherein the electrical equipments which release heat are supposed to be at the bottom of uh, this particular setup. And uh, so the brown patches that you see here can be considered as the process of heat that is the electrical equipment the electronic equipment that would be attached to this heat exchanger and uh, in order to cool those electronic equipment uh, we let a fluid at certain temperatures come into the uh, heat exchanger it flows through these channels and then goes out the hot fluid goes out from another channel uh, the flow fields for this particular setup can be seen here uh, at uh, so at uh, transient as well as at steady state and as a comparison these have been compared with LES simulations from the same reference and uh, while there are some distortions in the flow mostly these are because of the uh, as in uh, these what we have plotted here are instantaneous velocity profiles whereas the results that we have from literature are at uh, steady state. What you see is uh, the uh, velocity contours in both LES simulations as well as the simulations that we have carried out at SSL match quite well with each other. And uh, there is one vortex that is number four here that is missing in these simulations. And that's because of slight uh, changes in the geometry. Uh, these changes are there because we don't have all the information available about this geometry uh, with us but the point of this uh, study is to convey to uh, uh, you that uh, the lattice Boltzmann simulations depending on the uh, resolution will approach LES level accuracy without having to explicitly use turbulent models for any of these simulations uh, now we'll come to a uh, uh, setup that we have studied in great details for which is called uh, gasification. Gasification is also of uh, relevance, especially now that there is a lot of focus on clean energy. So the way gasification works is uh, any carbon mass, uh, this is typically 
true for coal and petcock particles. Any carbon ones, instead of burning it directly and obtaining uh, like the useful energy from it, the way this is done is uh, uh, we uh, burn this uh, carbon mass in oxygen deficient environment and we obtain uh, syngas and carbon monoxide. See, we obtain syngas, which is basically a mixture of hydrogen and carbon monoxide from this partial combustion. The syngas is then used for combustion wherever it is required. And uh, then uh, the rest of the tar and other things that are um, collected from gasifier are then uh, disposed of properly. So the advantage of this is uh, uh, Basically, it's easier to burn a gas phase fuel everywhere instead of a solid phase uh, fuel having to carry out everywhere. And also, uh, look at the uh, this thing, the environmental norms. Another advantage when it comes to refineries and pet coke industry is uh, uh, pet coke is a spent product from refineries, and uh, gasification allows it to be used as a source of energy generation instead of having to uh, think of ways of disposing it. What I'm showing here is a, a variant of what is called a two-stage gasification technology. It was originally developed by ConocoPhillips. The way this uh, works is uh, we have a first stage of this gasifier wherein uh, coal particles as well as oxygen and steam are let into the system. I mentioned at the start, the oxygen in these cases would be, uh, as in these are oxygen deficient environments. So the oxygen that is provided will be less than the stoichiometric requirement. Um, these uh, oxygen, coal particles and uh, steam, they undergo gasification reactions in the first stage. The gasification reactions, again, due to present are mostly exothermic reactions, again, mostly again due to presence of oxygen. And this leads to a lot of high temperatures. Uh, as in, while we get uh, syngas in first stage, it's also at very high temperature. And uh, it, uh, that very high temperature makes it difficult for uh, operators, or like for, it's difficult to operate uh, the high temperature gases. So in order to recover the heat from this high temperature uh, uh, products that are obtained in stage one, uh, we have another stage where we only let the uh, coal particles into the domain and not the oxygen in second stage. The reason for that is uh, at the temperature, since the temperatures are quite high in stage one, uh, in the same heat will be carried out in the second stage. And in second stage, uh, it will be predominantly the reverse water gas shift reaction that will drive the conversion of coal particles or uh, uh, to uh, useful syngas instead of uh, we having to provide additional energy as we do in first stage. So here the simulations have been carried out for uh, gasification reactors that we see in literate, uh, commonly see in industry. This one is a reactor where the height is about uh, 12 meters. The, uh, length of this first stage is around six meters. And uh, typically these simulations, the Reynolds number is quite high. It can range from 10 power five to 10 power six. And uh, to be able to carry out these simulations at high accuracy, you also need a uh, lot of, uh, like you need to resolve the flow, length scales in the fluid flow simulations in all the details. So these simulations have been carried out to wherein we have about 100 million grid points in the simulation. And uh, number of particles that we simulate here uh, explicitly are around 15 million. In this kind of setup, we consider six species of gas phase uh, for uh, reactions. These include hydrogen, methane, um, oxygen, water, and uh, CO2. And uh, uh, here, uh, for kinetics, explicit kinetics is concerned, uh, is used instead of uh, models for the combustion. This makes the simulation more expensive, but they also uh, allow us to uh, predict the performance of a given reactor with uh, more accuracy. And for particle phase, uh, the reactions, uh, so uh, 
we use particle parcel approach wherein one pa simulation particle represents a certain number of uh, actual particles and but each of the particle is tracked separately in the simulation in literature this is typically called euler lagrangian approach of simulations so what you see here is a velocity profile that gets developed in a gasification reactor due to the flow at inlet so at at inlet as i mentioned you we have oxygen uh, then steam and as well as uh, the particles that come in so particles i'll show in the next slide uh, here what i'm showing is the um, temperature inside the reactor the velocity field as well as the concentration of various species namely uh, carbon monoxide hydrogen uh, water uh, or steam oxygen carbon dioxide and uh, methane so what we can see is uh, oxygen is present only very close to the inlet because most of it as soon as it enters undergoes reactions both with particles as well as uh, other gases in in the in the gas phase and gets converted into co or uh, other useful products and uh, then you we can see that hydro both hydrogen and co get generated quite a lot close to the inlet and uh, then in rest of the reactor it's the uh, other methanation and other reactions that uh, dominate and uh, the particle uh, uh, dynamics in these kinds of simulations can also be seen here what is plotted is the velocity field next to the particle distribution that we see inside the reactor and uh, and the color of this particle here indicates the temperature of these particles so since they undergo combustion reactions their temperatures are likely as in they are likely to increase and that's why you see that most of these become red uh, as uh, the simulation proceeds or as they go into the domain once the uh, once the particle gets consumed completely due to reactions it's deleted from the setup that's why he, you don't see particles uh, or uh, so these were the examples from mostly process and semiconductor industry we also have uh, um, a division that works on aerodynamic simulation mostly for aerospace as well as automotive applications and uh, the results from some of the simulations that uh, they have carried out have been shown here Uh, one of the things that they have done is prediction of stall for naka uh, 0012 airfoil the plots that you see here in all the simulations are the comparison with experiments uh, then another problem which is uh, uh, thought of not possible with uh, conventional methods is calculation of dynamic derivatives because these require uh, transient simulations to be carried out uh another aeroacoustic while we did not discuss it it's uh, uh, quite useful for uh, especially for defense applications and uh, then from automotive we have flow pass dynamic body as well as wind surge geometry and things like that so uh, so this was about continuum and mesoscale modeling i'll also talk about some of the work that we have done at uh, molecular level as i mentioned at the start of the talk uh, uh, while the setups that we have in industry are mostly in uh, this mm to meter range as well as the time scales of interest uh, vary from let's say minute to hours or sometimes days or months for continuous operations uh, for semiconductor applications or for regimes where we have rarefied flows or high natural number flows uh, it becomes instructive to use molecular uh, simulations with uh, molecular modeling because uh, uh, for deposition studies it's what uh, what is of interest is uh, how is a given molecule getting deposited on the surface what is the porosity of the deposited material what are the phases in which they are getting deposited Uh, so those details can only be obtained from molecular dynamic or molecular modeling simulations and in the regimes which are typically called rarefied that is uh, 
um, uh, we have, uh, as in, that's where the continuum approximation breaks down, uh, or high mark number applications where, although the flows are in continuum regime, they are highly non equilibrium model. Uh, they are uh, highly, as in, non equilibrium flow setups and the continuum approximation or continuum models don't predict these results as accurately as uh, we would like. Uh, so in these cases, again, keeping the requirements of industry in mind, uh, most of the results that I'll show today are from Monte Carlo methods instead of molecular dynamic methods. The primary reason for that is uh, with Monte Carlo methods, especially in, if we are interested in let's say the steady state behavior of the system, it's, it's easy to simulate a relatively large system compared to a molecular dynamic simulations. So the two methods that uh, the results, two applications that I'll talk about today are uh, deposition studies for uh, plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition, and then a few simulations with uh, Monte Carlo flow simulation method called uh, discrete Monte Carlo simulation. So the plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition study in this context has been carried out uh, in the context of uh, deposition for manufacturing solar cells. Uh, so this chemical vapor deposition in solar cells can is done at uh, uh, various process conditions. Um, for example, atmospheric CVD, then low pressure CVD and uh, things like that. The one that we have looked at here is a plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition. This is useful in manufacturing solar cells uh, in, with this technology called heterojunction solar cell technology. The way it is, uh, so typically we will have a wafer that is placed in a, a chamber called uh, uh, a process chamber or a reactor. The wafer will be at the bottom. Then we have a shower head whose uh, who lets all the different gases that are supposed to uh, come in, react in the gas phase, and then get deposited on the surface uh, through the shower head. Uh, the reason uh, we have multiple inlets here in the shower head is to uh, make sure that we have as uniform concentration on the surface of vapor as possible. And uh, then here, the reactions are driven by presence of plasma. Uh, the reason for using plasma is uh, uh, without presence of plasma. So here the process that happens is uh, the silent molecule in the gas phase, they get dissociated into SiH3, SiH2 and other uh, uh, species. Uh, there can also be polymers of SiH, but uh, for today's discussion, we'll only consider the dissociation of SiH. And uh, then these dissociated uh, atoms or radicals, mm -hmm. they go and uh, interact or get deposited onto the surface. There are some reactions that happen on surface as well. And finally, we are left with silicon and hydrogen on the surface and rest of the uh, species are uh, they again desoft from the surface if that, uh, that's part of the chemistry. Again. And uh, for this process, if uh, plasma is not used, then the temperature required are quite high in the range of 1000 degrees or more than that. And with presence of plasma, we are able to carry out this same setup at in the, with the temperature range of around 200 degrees Celsius. Uh, while from operations point of view, it reduces the temperature requirement. In terms of flow modeling, the presence of plasma makes it quite complicated. Uh, what I'm showing here is uh, uh, as in coupling between various physics phenomena to if we were to model this plasma reactor in its complete details. So then we have flow, then diffusion due to multi-component uh, species that we have present both in gas phase as well as in the surface phase. Uh, then we also have plasma which uh, leads to high, which leads to presence of high uh, energy electrons in the system, which again, uh, allow, as in which again, uh, help dissociate the atoms, which then go on to deposit onto the surface and uh, uh, enhance the rate of deposition. So here, what we have carried out are uh, these deposition simulations, wherein 
we assume that the initial concent initially we have few silicon atoms on the surface and uh, then after that uh, for a given concentration of uh, gas uh, phase silicon and as uh, gas phase silane and hydrogen we look at how the deposition will proceed what uh, would be the phase of deposition what would be the void fractions in the deposition what will be the rate of growth of uh, or the rate of deposition now for a given process time what is the average height that we can get uh, so in carrying out these simulations one of the important assumptions that we have made is uh, we assume that the gas phase mixture inside the reactor uh, is uh, uh, as it doesn't have any concentration gradients it can be assumed to be at same concentration throughout the reactor and with this assumption then it's only the kinetics of the gas phase that uh, is important instead of the hydrodynamic behavior and with that so then we use a 0d model or kinetic only model to calculate the concentrations in the gas phase in this setup and we use these concentrations to carry out the deposition simulations using kinetic monte carlo method and uh, then with DSMC methods, of, uh, we have carried out simulations that are of interest to both, uh, uh, for example, aerospace community, especially for re-entry vehicles. That's the one that I'm showing right now, as well as uh, you know, this uh, deposition studies or the gas phase concentration studies for electron beam uh, physical vapor deposition calculations again. So here for re-entry vehicle, the initial part of the rocket would look something like this and uh, here the simulations with uh, direct mon numerical monte carlo method have been carried out to calculate the temperature heat flux and uh, pressure that is experienced by this particular uh, let's say the top of the re-entry vehicle when it re-enters the atmospheric condition so the Mach number here can be very large. In this case, it's around 15.6. The temperature initially, at, it can be low, but on the surface of the uh, of this uh, re-entry vehicle, the temperatures can reach uh, to very large values of some thousand degrees or so. What is shown here is the comparison of the uh, results that we have obtained with the simulations with uh, what is available in literature for pressure along the surface of uh, uh, this particular setup. And in high nutshell regime, that is uh, true for uh, this uh, electron beam physical vapor deposition systems. Uh, the reason for this electron beam uh, physical vapor deposition is, uh, so the turbine blades that are present in various uh, turbojet engines, uh, they experience very high temperature uh, uh, very high temperature conditions and when I say high the temperature is around 1500 to 2000 degrees Celsius which can be larger than the uh, melting point of uh, let's say the titanium or uh, uh, other metals that we have and uh, so then in order to prevent the damage to the airfoils that rotate inside these turbo engines these airfoils are coated with certain oxides which have very low thermal conductivity uh, these uh, oxides uh, which uh, have very low thermal conductivity and this coat they are coated with this oxides and that's called thermal barrier coating because uh, of their low uh, low thermal conductivity there is a significant temperature drop across this uh, uh, thin film that is deposited on top of these airfoils before we actually see uh, any temperature inside. So this enhances the life of these airfoils. This is carried out with, uh, uh, there are two methods to do this. Uh, the desired method is electron beam uh, physical vapor deposition because uh, the deposition which is carried out with this particular method leads to growth in columnar phases which have high strain rate resist resistance compared to the other uh, phase which is called cauliflower phase. Um, uh, for this. So here, the because the deposition is uh, uh, driven by electron beams, the pressure is necessary, the pressure has to be necessarily low 
then the natural number turns out to be very large if we take the um, characteristic length as the uh, chord length of this airfoil uh, then the natural number range from 10 to 5 to about 10 uh, with the reactor dimensions they can uh, as in they can vary quite a lot here what we are showing is uh, this uh, flow of zirconium oxide gas, which is finally will be deposited on this airfoil uh, through a diverging section here. And uh, the uh, flow comes in at around 50 meters per second and at temperature of 2500 degrees Celsius. This uh, temperature is chosen because that's the melting point. Uh, that's the temperature which is close to the melting point of zirconium oxide. and. Uh, these uh, molecules from zirconium oxide then go and uh, deposit onto the airfoil. The deposition along the surface of this airfoil uh, is shown with the arrows here. The arrows with uh, red color indicates a higher rate of deposition compared to the blue arrows. What is shown here is uh, temperature and velocity profile in this setup. So the temperature varies from around 1000 to 2005 degrees Celsius. It's, that's because the during operations, the airfoil is maintained at around 1000 degrees Celsius. Uh, so that's the reason you see variation in the temperature. So another set of simulations that we have carried out with uh, DSMC is uh, simulation of uh, uh, helium gas flow in, in a uh, in a small cavity, it, this, the reason for this is uh, uh, this is the kind of uh, heat uh, enhancement setup that is used in processing of uh, electronic chip manufacturing. And uh, uh, so typical wafer diameter will be around 300 mm. But in order to make sure that the wafer temperature is uniform along the entire uh, area that we have for the wafer, uh, the heat transfer is or the uh, uh, helium gas at a certain flow rate is flown just below the wafer. Now because of the aspect ratio, the natural number here turns out to be quite large. It is order one or higher than that. And for this, we have used, again, uh, this uh, discrete Monte Carlo simulation methods to carry out simulations and understand the temperature and flow behavior in the narrow region that just below the wafer, uh, so that uh, the process conditions just below the wafer can be optimized and uh, we have uh, a uniform temperature on top of the wafer. So with this, I conclude the talk today. I hope I was able to convince you and show you various examples from multi-physics flows as well as multiple length scale flow simulations that uh, we have carried out at Sankhya Sutra Labs. Uh, as Ashwin mentioned at the start, uh, Please feel free to ask any questions that you may have. And uh, in terms of engagement models, uh, Ashwin can provide more details with respect to this, but I'll just summarize this slide for you. Uh, we work with uh, whatever engagement models that are convenient for the users. In cases where we have, uh, uh, as in ready to ship products, we can we may work in product license or simulation as a service domain. In most of the cases, we have worked with clients in either custom development or consultancy services mode, because in most cases, uh, uh, we have dealt with problems where there are no ready-made solutions available, as, or uh, there are uh, requirements of adding physics that are not currently modeled uh, in the uh, uh, that are currently modeled. So in order to, uh, as in, in th these kinds of set uh, setups, we work with either custom development or consultancy services mode. So with that, uh, I 